Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Aortic Kitchen. I'm Mindy Seltzer, the Aortic Dietitian. And hi, I'm Rob Seltzer, the Aortic Chef, and welcome to our kitchen. Uh, tonight, we are going to be talking about uh, some ideas for menu planning and meal prep. Several people have asked us about this, and uh, it's really not that difficult. Mindy's going to do the presentation on that, and it's really all about the planning, okay? And then I'll do a little demo afterwards and uh, make another recipe that people have been asking me for. So uh, that also can be advanced prep. So uh, no further ado, do it, Mindy. Oh, thank you, sir. All right. Menu is the first thing you start out when you want to make your grocery list, cooking, everything else. Break the menu down into its parts. A menu is defined as a group of recipes put together to create a meal. So you start with the menu, then you look up your recipes for whatever you want and write down your list of ingredients. From a single ingredient to many, but write the list and you may have some overlapping things so it'll help you find um, what you need when you get to the grocery store. So let's start with menu planning and meal prep. These are the fundamentals and I'll go into a little more detail. First thing you do is check your calendar, take stock of your kitchen, it could be an inventory, start to build the plan, which we talked about making the menu. Then you build your shopping list, try to keep your nutritional balance as you're doing things. And one of my favorite things is cook Cook once, eat twice, or maybe even three times. Then we're going to discuss prep. Don't be frazzled like the woman on the side. We're going to get rid of that frazzling. So let's check your calendar. How many meals do you need to make? Are you doing lunch supper or just a supper? You figure that out. Two people, four people, six people, eight people, whatever your family size is. Are you going out to eat this week? Uh-oh, someone got invited to dinner, so you're having guests for this week. If you're still working, do you take your lunch to work? And if you're not, why aren't you? <laughs> what day can you shop? And what day can you do meal prep? They do not have to be on the same day. The first thing we do is we're gonna take stock of our kitchen. First, you check your pantry. That's where all your dry goods are stored. Your cabinets where your spices and herbs are or however you handle it in your house. The refrigerator and the freezer. So you see what's already available so you don't repeat purchase. FIFO means first in and first out. What needs to be used first? Sometimes when I'm in the mood, when I bring my canned products, I date the top of the can so I know how old it is compared to the next can I have, and I use the oldest one first. Treasure hunting. Whoops, sorry about that. Treasure hunting. What did you mean by treasure hunting? What do I mean by treasure yeah. hunting? Well, how many of you have ever looked in your freezer and all of a sudden you find these packages that you didn't remember were there. It's that old, uh, you know, it's a piece of roast or a frozen chicken or maybe some lasagna, whatever, but it's been there probably maybe way too long. And sometimes, especially if you have a chest freezer, things get lost in the bottom. So make sure you go through and go treasure hunting, okay? Uh -huh. To find those things. And that's the stuff that you wanna use now, right? right? Use now, don't wait for tomorrow. And if you put the date on it, and it just has to be the month and the year, um, you'll know when to use it. Categorize your groups when you're writing your list up. Your proteins, and this is what you have. Your grains, rices, etc. Lentils, fruits and vegetables. And that can be either fresh or canned, because sometimes Canned is okay, or frozen, and you wanna keep track of what you have. And the last category is dairy. So let me back up on you for one okay. second. You said you can date things, mm -hmm. uh, so you know when to use them, but 
So how long should you leave things in the freezer? At what point is it like, uh oh, you know, well, and, and how if, do I know? If it hasn't thawed or refrozen, some things can still be eaten in a year, but it's usually six months. You want to try to rotate every six months. Especially with home freezers because they're not as cold as commercial freezers. And also the other thing you want to look at, especially with these treasures you might find as you open them up, and I'm sure most people know what freezer burn is. And that's when, you know, everything is just white, white and dried out. Uh, that's because, like Mindy just said, it probably thawed out and then got refrozen or it got moisture in there. And that caused it to uh, to burn, like the ice crystals, and then they dehydrate, uh, which uh, then just makes it, it it's not going to be very palatable if you cook it. So that's the stuff you probably want to just throw out if you find you it. Just throw it into chili or something. Well, you can, <laughs> but you know, it's it's really not it's not gonna hurt you, put it, it like that. It won't hurt you, just won't have full flavor. It won't taste great. And it won't taste great if you try to serve it by itself, as itself. So then I continue, sir. Your I'm all done. Oh well, thank you. So the first thing we have to do is start the plan. Make a menu. Start with the center of the plate. Chicken, shrimp, veggie, tofu, fish, whatever you happen to like and what you feel is healthiest. As we said before, use up the oldest items first. The only way you're gonna know which item is oldest is with that month and year put it on the package. You picked out all your recipes that you think you wanna make for this week, check the recipes for ideas and some guidance. Add your complimentary dishes. When you add the complimentary dishes and what we do before we go grocery shopping, even if it's online, like some people we know, check the grocery store ad. Is it a buy one, get one free? Have they reduced the price because it's near the holidays? Like turkey this week was 99 cents a pound, where the rest of the year it's about $1.49 or $2, and this is the whole turkey. So during the seasonal holidays, you will see markdowns on entrees for the center of the plate. Try one new food a week. Last year, I was in one of the nicer grocery stores that had a lot of small items, and I found this broccoli, and it was lime green, and it was, I don't know, shaped with a cone with points out of it. It's actually called uh, Rom Romanesco, and it is Family, it is in the cauliflower and broccoli family. It doesn't have that strong sense in it. If you see it, it's fun because it's a really pretty vegetable. Look, what else do you like? What vegetables haven't you eaten in a long time? Oh, I want some beets. Well, do you want fresh beets and have to cook them all? Or there are prepackaged beets still and already cooked, so half your work is done for you. You can go to the vegetable aisles and find what you need there. So be inspired, be excited. Think about what would I like to try this week? Then we're gonna build our shopping list. You have your recipes so you can select the ingredients. Looking as we've checked in our freezer, do we have a lot of the ingredients already? And then we only have to buy what we need. Check the grocery store ads again to match up the items on sale. Refrigerated, frozen, canned, and whole portions and cut foods. Decide how you want to cook it. Seasonal, convenience, and cost and zero waste. For example, we love fish. So sometimes we will buy a whole salmon, maybe two and a half, three pounds, but we're definitely not going to cook that for three people. We cut it up, put it in bags, the seal meal bag, sucks the air out so it doesn't get any ice build up. We date it, put it in the refrigerator, and it's ready for another meal. Whether I use the same recipe or a different one, I know how the product is going to be. Staples. Always keep staples in your pantry, whether it's beans, lentils, bulgur, quinoa, you want to try different quinoas, you want rices, you want to use brown rice, red rice, 
or just plain white rice, jasmine rice. There's a whole bunch of different products you can look at. When you're looking at the label, always try to select minimally processed versus over-processed. Hey, Rob, what do you mean by that? Well, as we know, processed foods typically contain a lot of sodium. You are correct. All right. So minimally processed, something, think about how many times something is uh, worked or played with in order to get it where it is. So minimally processed is, you know, flour is minimally processed. Because, I mean, obviously, you could buy whole grain wheat and take it home and grind it yourself. Absolutely. Some people do. Okay. Canned tomatoes, like we've talked about, good Italian tomatoes. Those are minimally processed. All they are is tomatoes that have been uh, cooked in the can. There's no added salt. There's nothing else like that added to it. Compared to uh, a frozen lasagna, okay? Mm. Now, there's a fully processed prepared food that has lots of sodium in it, as well as some other things. Or either, uh, you know, mixes and things like that. You know, mac and cheese in the box. You know, we can go through that and read all the different ingredients. And some of them, you know, uh, hard to pronounce. I'll leave it at that. Uh, so those are, you know, More over fried. processed or highly processed compared to, or even minimally things we'll, we'll talk about in the grocery store. I think many mentions like if you don't want to cut your vegetables in the produce department, they now sell pre-cut fresh vegetables, sliced zucchini, things like that, and you can. That's still processed, but they haven't done anything to other than cut it with a knife. Right. So if you're not feeling up to chopping everything, go to the section that your onions are already cut, your green beans are already clipped, and all you have to do is microwave the bag. There's so many convenient, minimally processed foods in the stores now. you got to take your time and look. And when we do the shopping tour next time, we'll go over some of those. And my favorite thing is eat the rainbow. So basically what we're looking at is balancing your plate. So protein is usually your main entree, but it doesn't have to be what we're used to. It can be two to five ounces, which is a chicken thigh, um, gal portion of a piece of fish, five shrimp, if you buy the gum, jumbo shrimps, or it could be 10 shrimp if you buy the 32 count shrimp. Grains, whether you're going to make rice. Are you putting pasta in that grains group here? Yes, depending okay. on the pasta. Okay. Yes, it's wheat or it's, it is wheat. it's, or it's other grains. Or yes. it's other grains because there's the chickpea pastas that are out there now. And your vegetables, three to five servings a day. I'm not going to tell you a portion size, but the minimum size is a half a cup. Now we're going to go fruits and vegetables. Fruits. If you are the person, and I do not even have one available to show you, but at least close enough, this apple, if you can look at it, is about one and a half servings. This apple is one serving. So two servings is pretty easy to get. All right, so those big red delicious apples they sell in the grocery store. They're three or four servings. Right, they're sure. sold by count size. But those are those are pretty giant. What she just showed you was a just a nice, typical little gala apple. And if you're looking in, I think most of the stores now have quote unquote kitty apples for lunch boxes. That's the right size piece of fruit. Or if you're eating an apple, you cut it in half and share it with somebody. Dairy, that can be cottage cheese, that could be yogurt, that could be milk, um, sour cream. If you make yourself a hot cocoa for breakfast in the morning, that all adds to your two to three servings of dairy a day. So, one of the true secrets to making your life easy in the kitchen is cook once, eat twice. Or more. For example, if you make a huge lasagna and you're only using a quarter for dinner, then you've got three more dinners already prepared. Once you wrap it up, put it in your, if you're having this week, you can put it in your refrigerator and you can take the other two portions and put them in your freezer. 
So don't spend a day cooking to try to pack and store and get everything together so that you don't have to do it. Just cook a little extra when you make your general meal prep for the day. When you start in the beginning of the week, you probably don't have a whole lot of leftovers left. By the weekend, you will also have enough prepared meals so you don't even have to cook on the weekend. It's just pull out, heat up, and use it. There are advantages to preparing certain ingredients in bulk. We can have them ready when you need them. Beans. And I know some people really like beans and rice together and they eat that frequently. So they can cook the beans once and have them for two or three days. You could cook the rice. You can cook the rice for two or three days. And Rob will go over a little bit more how to hold that. Hard cooked eggs can be safely stored for five to seven days. You can either put them in a sealed bag, either peel or in the shell. My preference is to peel them because when they're cold, they're a little harder to peel. Put them in a Ziploc bag. You can put a little water with a bit of salt in it if you'd like, because that's the way they do the packaged eggs. Or you can just put a wet paper towel and seal the bag. The key to proper handling Excellent sanitation practices and quick chilling of hot foods will keep you healthy as well as giving you your extra meals. So Rob is gonna talk about the next series of questions and I'm gonna let him take my seat. Okay. Oh. All right, thank you, Mindy. That was some good welcome. stuff. Short, quick summary of that, really. A lot of you have already been meal prepping. People said, I really want to learn how to meal prep, but you've been doing it. Like when you make that lasagna and freeze it, that's basically meal prep. Now, more intentional meal prep is what I want to talk about, where you're actually just sitting down and you know, bringing stuff home from the grocery store, and then you're going to uh, turn it, you know, get the meals ready for the week or wherever. So, couple of rules that you really need to, to follow that I have here for you. As many just said, the key to it really is to having good, safe meal prep is that you have a you, you, real high sanitation and that you uh, always, you know, get your foods quickly to chill them and in the refrigerator or freezer and protecting them from air. So that was the problem with the freezer burn. So when we uh, do freeze products uh, like protein, like some salmon, we'll buy a, sal a side of salmon, which you don't have to do. Uh, but we use that uh, food saver, they call it now. They used to call them uh, seal meals. They're little vacuum machines, but they really do totally uh, protect the food from you know, the air is really the worst, the biggest enemy in the freezer. So you want to suck all the air out of the bag and put it away. You can do it for proteins. You can seal cheese that way. You can seal vegetables. Uh, typically, if you want to do vegetables uh, for freezing, which you really don't need to do for our purposes, uh, but you'd have to blanch them and anything. So there's, there's just extra stuff. So as I say on the slide, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. I could have put it everywhere. Wash your hands frequently while you're prepping because it's so easy to contaminate food while you make it. Uh, some quick little notes, and these are here, so you can review this later uh, if you want to watch the program and just you know, advance to this slide and any of, any of the slides that we have out there. One, use an ice bath to quickly lower the temperature of hot foods to below 70 before refrigerating or freezing. Okay, heat is the enemy of, or is, is the good friend of spoilage, okay? It's the enemy of keeping foods safe. So the standard is typically to reduce the temperature of a hot food down to 70 degrees within two hours and then down below 40 degrees in, they say, in up to four. But you can use device, different devices. Um, I typically just make an ice bath, you know, just a bowl of water and some ice cubes, and I will put my pot right in there. And, uh, but you definitely want to get things when I even, if I do an ice bath, I'll, I can get a pot of boiling, almost boiling, you know, pasta sauce after dinner and get it cooled down to 70 degrees in about 15 minutes. 
takes no time. Or you can use little tools like these. These are little silicone deals that you fill with water and freeze them, and they're like ice blocks. You just throw it in the food in the pot of soup, or you stir it in the pot of soup, whatever you want to do, and it helps cool it down quickly. But you want to cool your foods as fast as possible, okay? Uh, if you have large things, uh, like a lot of vegetables or, or so on, you want to, like, spread them out on a sheet pan or something to allow them to cool quicker. When you do things deep, they don't cool quick, okay? It's almost like an hour per inch, so you got to be careful. So the vacuum sealer, we said, uh, always prep your fruits and vegetables before working with meat, poultry, fish, or eggs. All right, so what we're saying, the foods that are ready to eat that you probably may not cook, uh, salad, things of that nature, you definitely want to prep those first before you do your protein, right? You don't want to do the chicken and then do the lettuce. That's just dangerous. But you're always going to wash your workspace when changing food products, no matter what food product it is. So when you go from fruits to vegetables or so on, you still want to give that board a quick rinse and your knife a quick rinse um, for that. But then when you go between uh, into the protein areas and you need to wash it with soap and water and get and ready to go down. Um, probably not, not at this point. Uh, we don't really need to bleach down too much. Now, after you're doing chicken, if you make a big mess within your sink, you might want to uh, use your little bit of bleach and rinse off your, you know, or some, one of those sprays that are antibacterial made by, you know, like Clorox cleanup, things like that. Spray your sink down and, uh, and your work area to destroy any errant bacteria that happen to escape from your workspace. Because you don't notice it, but when like, you cut a chicken, it splashes, okay? Um, so, rinsing pasta under cold water was a great way when you save uh, things like that, you, they're, gonna, they're really starchy. So if you put them away in the refrigerator, they're gonna just one big mass when you pull it out, okay? So, now I would never tell you to do that when you're cooking and serving pasta at the same time. If you're having pasta for dinner with a sauce, all right, you want to, uh, you, you don't want to rinse it. You want to take the pasta right from the pot and put it into the pan with the sauce real quick because that starch is going to help hold the sauce to it. But the stuff that you're saving for later, you need to rinse it under cold water to cool it down because there is a danger with grains. Um, I'll mention that in a minute. And it'll also rinse off that starch so it won't be quite as sticky. But before you use it again, you're going to have to rinse it with cold water before you heat it up again, because it's still gonna be all sticky, or put it in the pan. Like when I reheat rice, I put cold water in the, the bowl, uh, and then whether it's on top of the stove or in the microwave, and that creates some steam and helps to separate the grains of rice. Uh, now, and if you're going to say, if you're doing vegetables, rice, pasta for later in the week, we're gonna wanna par cook or blanch them. So blanching vegetables, is where you drop them in boiling water or throw them in the microwave for a few minutes until they par cook and then you dip them in ice water or make it or, or cold water. Same thing with rice and pasta, those you wanna par cook. Uh, so if you're intentionally cooking pasta ahead or if you know they're gonna make it a big batch and save it for later, take some of the pasta out for later a minute or two early and then drain that you know, in the sink and rinse it while the rest of the pasta cooks for dinner tonight. Uh, same thing you do with rice, because then if you reheat it, it's gonna cook some more and nobody likes mushy pasta or really sticky rice, okay? So those are a few really simple things. Uh, and I'm gonna make something tonight. In fact, I'm gonna make some pasta and some sauce and show you real quick how we would uh, cool that down uh, and get it ready for the, you know, for story. Uh, some other things, I had something I was going to tell you that I totally forgot but about. But I can it. tell them something. Go ahead. because uh, One of the things you want to do is organize your refrigerator. I know it sounds frustrating. You get food, you shove it in the refrigerator or whatever. Try to put it in sections. One of the most important things is when you're taking your foods from the stove and you're putting them in the refrigerator, you want to keep your food that's warm on the top shelf of the refrigerator because heat rises. So if you put it on the bottom shelf, whatever's on the shelf above is going to get warmed up from the food that's below it. Right. Now, the other thing I was talking about, the, you know, vacuum packing uh, foods for later. 
um, which is a great idea. And it works well if you want to do that. And if you ever want to, I mean, I can do that. I've done some breaking down chickens, you know, how to skin and portion fish. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with using, in fact, it's, I even advise it, you know, portion controlled uh, products like fish, especially. Uh, if you look at my freezer, I have bags of, you know, pre cut, pre portioned tuna steaks, four ounces each. Each one's individually packed because uh, they're fresher than. What we call fresh. Uh, Mindy mentioned that I had this, the slide. You know, it said I it said refrigerated. It didn't say fresh. Refrigerated, frozen, canned. Okay, because refrigerated is not the same. You know, fresh. Fresh is not fresh. Fish that you get that is marked fish is uh, either you know can be as much as ten days old, as it goes. You know, comes in from the day boats or they're not day boats anymore. Uh, most of them are out at sea. So, but you know, they put the fish in the hold, and then they keep fishing and bring it back. So, some are just still, processed. It's still good, right? There is processing. That's the frozen stuff that you want. When they process at sea, they have all these fishing trawlers, and then there's a factory ship, and the fishers, the fishermen, the boats go to the factory ship every day, give them their fish, and it is immediately, usually within like a half hour, it's already on its way to the freezer. They, you know, they skin it, they fillet it, or they steak it, whatever they need to do. And um, that fish is only hours old. And so when you thaw it, it's still only hours old, rather than even being days or maybe a week or more old. Same thing, especially with shrimp. I never buy fresh shrimp. Shrimp should be frozen, you know, as soon as possible. Um, so it's, it works you know, really well. So that's why I call these things refrigerated. And even some of the fish you buy in the store, you read your labels, um, they use the they, words. They, they say previously frozen. Previously frozen, right? If you go to Costco or anywhere else, it says right on the label and in your grocery stores, uh, like cod often, and some of the salmon and so on. Previously frozen, previously frozen. So they get it frozen, they thaw it out, and then package, you know, and repackage it, and put it out there. And I'm like, why? You know, just leave it frozen. It's going to be fresher when I thaw it out for the first time. Or if I take that home now and cut it up and freeze it, now I'm freezing it twice which is not good for fish, okay? You want fish that's only been once frozen. So I know they do it because people think that, you know, thawed is better. I'll call it, because I won't call it fresh. It's not necessarily fresh. Unless you so, went to the dock and picked it up. That day, so, or you caught it yourself, okay? But, um, so those are some ideas. We'll come with some more. Uh, and I'm gonna move on and go into the cooking portion of this evening. One of so, the other things I wanted to comment on, we use a vacuum pack. Before we had a vacuum pack, I used to use the thick Ziploc bag, put a straw in it, squish it down as much as I could till there's just the straw was there and suck the rest of the air out of it. It lasted maybe not six months, but I could get one or two months out of it. Right, yep, so again, so we want to be quick. The biggest thing of all is all I can say. Oh, I remember I was going to tell you about real fast, but with, I can talk while I'm cooking with the pasta, uh, is about Bacillus cereus. Okay, so a while back online, someone had asked me about making pasta sauce, about my, my good marinara sauce. So um, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Let it go. So. Um, my phone's ringing, the one that's the camera, and <laughs> you can't hear it, and it's just a, a pain in the butt, so it'll go away. All right, so I'm gonna make marinara sauce with no salt in it. I always talk about Italian tomatoes, uh, and Josh, if we wanna switch maybe to the other cameras, and, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, as soon as I stop sharing, okay. I yeah, that's that. the last I'm slide. Sorry. I killed that chair. I forgot that. Not presenting. Okay. Okay. Hi guys. I'm in my kitchen. We were hiding behind that PowerPoint screen the whole time. Okay. So you have me in the other. Yeah. Okay. I'll let you deal with it. If we need to move the other camera on the ring light, let us know. So making marinara. Now I'm gonna make it a little bit different because it is 
we're not using any salt. I've got tomatoes that have no salt added, okay? okay. Whole plum tomatoes. <laughs> See, they're right there, Mindy. Mm -hmm. Whole, you know, this is reversed, but they're whole plum tomatoes, whole peeled, and there's no salt added, okay? Yes. Uh, uh, oh. yes, no salt added. So we have to replace flavor. I always talk about that. We have to add flavor. So typically, if I was to make a marinara sauce, in a restaurant, it would just be a little bit of onion and garlic and tomatoes and basil, that's it. But we wanna do some more uh, flavor. So I'm gonna do a mirepoix, or in Italy, they actually call it sofrito. Just like in the islands, in the Caribbean, and in the Latin America, they use the term sofrito, but that would be onions and celery and peppers uh, and cilantro. Uh, this, the mirepoix is my typical carrots, onions and celery. One, two parts onion, one part carrot, one part celery. And that adds a lot of flavor. Celery has the natural salts in it, which brings up some of that salt flavor. And all we do is take it. I've already got some ready here. Okay, so I'm ready to go. And I've almost pureed it, okay? And how did I do that? I'm gonna get this part going. We're gonna saute that real fast. Now, if you really, I've got carrot, onion, and celery here, and I said in the recipe to put it in a food processor or blender, or even have one of these handy little hand uh, cutters, which are really nice. They're great for those of us that may have, like Mindy, whose hand hurts a lot right now. Josh, can you switch to the other camera? So you remember how you guys had a presentation and then we were going to do this? Remember that? It's okay. It's yeah. Okay. We're, we're going to go with one main camera for the show. Okay. So I'm good. So I use this sucker. Can you do the... Okay. The other, the other camera. It the other camera shot. It does really well. Okay. And it's easy to clean, so I just throw that into the pan as well. So see, typically, most people see this, oh, you're putting carrots and celery in your pasta sauce? How could you do that? Because the Italians do. They use that carrot to sweeten the pasta. And we're just oh. adding, we're building flavor here. It's also what we're doing. We're building flavor. Now, so I just want to cook this for a few minutes until it Breaks I'm going to give you a little hint after you're doing this. Some people like to add vegetables and chop them up very fine into that because some people don't like vegetables, so they hide it in the sauce. Yes, like with your kids putting cauliflower in the mac and cheese. Okay. So you want to cook this. It's, it's going to melt down. You give it a good 10 minutes, which I'm not going to do. It will really break down and get uh, when it gets soft and it's gonna reduce a good, at least by half, okay? Now, the recipe also calls for fresh basil. If you don't have any fresh basil, you can use dry basil, okay? That's just fine, which is what I'm gonna to do today because Mindy didn't find any that looked good in the store. So the only difference being, if I use dry herbs, I add them early on, like during this point of it, this part of the recipe, so that I can so I can do what I, you know, so it rehydrates, okay? So, now, remember, if you're using dried, uh, you use about a quarter of what it would call for fresh. If they call for a tablespoon of fresh basil, you're going to use about a teaspoon of dry basil because when it rehydrates, it comes back. So, I'm going to add that to my sofrito so it can start hydrating now and infuse the flavor into the rest of the vegetables that are in there. And you see that's already reduced quite a bit. Really cooked down. This is the onions that really needed to release all their water. And we're just about there. And I think I'm gonna need a little bit more. I just know this particular basil. Okay. And it's gonna take some pepper. You know what flavor basil has? What's the dominant flavor? And it's actually, it's, I find it very interesting because this peanut flavor, 
Yeah, peanut butter <laughs> is found throughout the herb world, okay? And it has the same flavor, same basic flavor notes as tarragon, as uh, what else? As fennel, okay? Anise, where am I leading to? Licorice. Large amount of the herbs that chefs use all have licorice flavors, but in different intensities. Where fennel, you know, fennel seed or uh, real fennel will is, is very licorice, you know, anisette, that type of thing. Um, basil is not quite as much, it has other uh, herbaceous flavors in it. And the, uh, you know, tarragon as well is mainly, they're all forms of licorice, which I find pretty interesting. Now, while that's cooking, the other thing we have to do, once it's almost ready, throw our garlic in. Some Italian chefs will be like, why are you adding garlic to marinara? You don't need garlic in marinara, but we're American and we like garlic in all of our Italian food. So with my lovely fresh whole peeled tomatoes, if we just throw these in the pot, they're going to, uh, you know, they're not gonna break down in time because this is a 15 minute sauce, okay? It's all it takes. So now while that's starting, I'm also, I have two things I'm gonna do. My water is going for my pasta. You wanna try to time things. Pasta takes about this particular one. Sure, it'll tell you right on the box, you know, cook it for seven to nine minutes. That's pretty good. Now, do I need a whole pound of pasta for all this for us? No, but if we're cooking ahead, we may cook the whole box or a half a box, whatever it may be, okay? So I'm gonna cook maybe a little bit over half the box. And just get this going. Yeah, this is, I mean, you got the thin spaghetti. I did not. You didn't? This is the regular spaghetti? Okay. Wow. There's this <laughs> nice and thin. So this is the yellow box. I usually don't tell you about brands, but this is the Barilla uh, yellow box, and which is their Protein Plus. Okay. Protein Plus. Nice thing about this, a two ounce serving, which is the normal serving of their pasta, has the same amount of protein as a four ounce chicken breast. Okay, now you add your pasta to the water, it's boiling, it'll just kind of melt in and then stir. The big thing with cooking pasta is lots of sauce, uh, lots of water, so it doesn't stick together, okay? That camera's going, so anyways, all right. I'll explain later. So the tomatoes, as I was saying, if you just dump them in from the can, these are all whole peeled tomatoes. So they need to be broken. Now you can, I throw them in a blender. I, if I'm doing a lot, I can take a little knife or the easy way is just take your hand and start breaking them up. Wow, you're doing yeah, and exercises. Yeah, this is exercises for my hand that has also has problems. That chef's disease I talk about, it's kind of like not quite carpal tunnel, but so I'm just breaking them up with my hands. So you can see, keep them under the juice so they're gonna squirt all the way across the kitchen. When you do this, now they're just nice tomato pieces. Okay. Let me come back this way. Ah, there we go. So now we got nice tomato pieces. All right. Instead of whole tomatoes. All right. So my sofrito has done well. Okay, that's ready. I can take my glove off. Really didn't, there was nothing left in this can, so I didn't really need to rinse it. If you have a tomato with a thick puree in it, you will need to just rinse it with a little bit of water and throw that in, it'll just cook off. Okay, this is ready. How do I know when my garlic's done? Uh, when you smell it, it only takes a minute, unless you're going for a, you know, caramelized. So now we just wanna add our tomatoes.
Okay. Give it a quick stir. And let it cook. Typically about 10, 15 minutes, but we will push this one a little bit. There we go. And if there's some bigger pieces of tomato, they will break down. Or if you really like your sauce smooth, you can go ahead and take a, you know, an immersion blender and stick it in there and puree it up. That's up to you. It depends how you like your sauce. Some people like it chunky. Some people like it smooth. You know, some people like a nut. Some people don't, right? Absolutely. Okay, so this pasta is getting there. I'm going to check. You gonna show them the old way to check pasta? No, I'm not gonna show them. It's not the old way. That's the wrong way. Oh. <laughs> when he's talking about the silly way of throwing it up against the wall. If it sticks, it's that's done. not. That's a fallacy. If it sticks, it's overdone. So don't even bring it up. Yeah. It's too late. You already did. Okay. So I'm gonna check and see how far along it is, what I'm gonna to try to do, okay, is just break it in half with my thumb and see, which you were not gonna be able to see. Do you wanna see how much of a starch in the center? You'll have a little, if it's not cooked, it'll have a nice white center. The more, you know, that it just keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And this looks to me, if I go in the light, since I am blind, uh, this is pretty well done, okay? Sure, go right ahead. And I just use my same spoon that I use for the sauce. Because I also want to pull out while it's al dente and undercooked. Because I'm going to cook it in the sauce. Now, if you really do Italian food and pasta right, you don't just drain off the pasta and put it on a plate and then put sauce on top of it. Then you get watery sauce. It runs all over the place. And that's no good. So what um, do I do if I cook that whole box of pasta? And I only want to use part of it for supper. That's what I was just saying a few minutes ago. Okay. You come and you take some of it out early. And then you start the rinse process. Which is where I'm going. So I'm just doing this by the stove. You don't have to see it. I'm taking the pasta out. For tomorrow. Rest will come back. Now I'm going to drain this. To have this nice pasta pot with a built in colander on it. These are great. Okay, now I leave it in the pot, turn my stove off, because it's just going to burn. But what you want to do is to allow some of that water to cook off. You need cold water on the pasta in the sink. Get that working. Swirl this around a little bit. Don't put oil on it. No olive oil yet, okay? You put oil on it, what's gonna happen? This just the all the- sauce is gonna slide off. All the sauce is gonna slide off. So you want it to- Adhere. Be, be there. You don't want to oil it up. Now, one thing I did, because I was working too fast, Sometimes you can, a lot of chefs, and I normally do this, is save a cup of the pasta water because it's starchy and you can pour that into your sauce and it helps it thicken up and it makes it stick to your pasta even better by you know, adding that little bit of starchy water to it. So really good idea. Before you pour all that water off, take a little teacup or take a measuring cup, dip it in there and you know get a half a cup of, or a cup full of pasta water and then add it as necessary to your sauce, okay? Now, so this is now looking good, okay? Oop. It's always tough working backwards, okay? So what I would do now before serving, this will not go on the plate like that. I always 
chopsticks on my sauce. And add that to the pasta in the pan. As I said, you know, it's going to finish cooking in the pan with some sauce, not all of it. Okay. Toss around, put it back over the heat. My burner's still plenty hot. Let that cook into the pasta because this will give the pasta more flavor. If you just dump sauce on top of plain cooked pasta, they're two separate entities. This way, we have pasta that's flavored with pasta sauce because it's going to finish cooking with it and absorb that pasta flavor. What would you like? I wanted to taste that flavor. So, all right. So you can see that. Okay. This needs to really cook for a couple more minutes, but we are not going to go all that way today. Now, anyone so we us? will pretend, okay, this can cook for any for another 15 minutes. You can cook for another hour if you want. Let it reduce down. Now, marinara is not a really thick, heavy sauce. That's not that all day pasta sauce. Marinara, marinara is almost a cook to order sauce. Do it very fast. Uh, these particular tomatoes, uh, we're more packed in tomato juice rather than the other ones which I buy, uh, which are packed in tomato puree, which is thicker. So these need to we'll need a little bit of time cooking down. But let's say I want to save this now. So my pasta over here is nice and cold. That's ready to go into a container, okay, for later this week. And I have a couple of those ready, sort of. And I have a container ready. So here's pasta for our lunch or dinner later this week, which I can use our sauce or I can use our uh, anything else I want to put it with. You know, I can make a pasta salad. I can make sesame noodles with this, whatever I have on my menu. But now the pasta is ready. Ready to go in the refrigerator. It's all ice cold. The tomato sauce. That's true. I could have used the same container I had the sofrito in, Mindy. I know where you're going with that. Yes, you do. Remember, we talked about sanitation. Because he's putting it in that tall container. I just have to be more careful about getting it cold quicker. quicker. I'm not a danger here because I'm going to cool it down in an ice bath, okay? Right. With just ice water and uh, in the sink. And I put this in my bowl with the cold water and some ice cubes and cool it down. So with a little bit of stirring, this will come down to refrigerator ready in about 10 minutes, okay, with some ice cubes around it. So. So typically it is somewhat dangerous to try to chill and save things in really deep containers, like, you know, nothing more than really two inches. So a casserole dish is fine that you might have a pie plate, uh, but nothing four inches, you know, some of those four inch deep containers for really hot, especially high protein foods. And back to this, I wanted to keep telling you about Bacillus cereus. Now, Bacillus is a bacteria, uh, they're uh, rod shaped. And Sirius is a, you know, that uh, there's Salmonella, there's Streptococcus, which is round, uh, all the different uh, Clostridium perfringens, lots of different bacteria. The one that's really hit hard in the last five years, 10 years is Bacillus Sirius. And that is a uh, organism that thrives in grains, cereus, as in cereals. So people didn't really think about it, but rice and uh, some pastas, uh, Grain. you know, grains, uh, bulgur, uh, anything like that, barley, they are extremely dangerous when left at room temperature. 
Okay, they are now considered a potentially hazardous food by the FDA and by the health department. So they need to be treated just like they are a piece of chicken. It is all after right? they're cooked, correct? Yes, yes, after they're cooked, not when they're raw, they're all dry and they're safe. But once they're cooked, uh, they can become contaminated and, they, and there have been a lot of uh, foodborne illness uh, events where, or food outbreaks that have been caused when they trace them back, it all gets back to the rice or the barley um, or a rice salad, something like that, that they made that sat out on the buffet for a long time or sat out in the kitchen when they made it. Uh, and then lots of people get sick. And you know, the first thing they say, oh my God, it was the chicken. Well, it wasn't the chicken, it was the rice, okay? So be as careful with grains, serious, seriously about the cereal, okay? All those products are just as dangerous as that piece of chicken you may have on the counter. So, all right, so our pasta sauce, is going along real well. And so what we would do at this point is go ahead and plate it up. And in order to do that, I need a bowl or a plate. Do we do a plate or a uh, bowl? White bowl? The white bowls? The white bowls. The white bowls, okay. My mother bought these for us a long, long, long time ago. How about the brown ones? Because when we had <laughs> dinner one night and she was over, bless her soul, and her memory was, you know, wasn't anything proper to eat these big bowls of pasta out of. So she went out to the store and bought us these big white bowls, which are really too big for most of anything but salad. Um, I mean, you don't want to fill this with pasta because this is going to be, you know, the whole box. We can take some Maybe pasta. Do for serving. Okay, a nice little pasta in the bowl. Okay, and now you see it's got nice sauce to it already. There we go. There's the money shot. Okay, take some of your sauce. If I had some fresh basil, I would obviously garnish this with a nice little sprig of fresh basil. Okay. And our sauce, pasta and sauce right there. Marinara is served. ready to go. So and this is marinara. Now, let me finish, please. So marinara obviously is, is vegetarian, which is great. Uh, if you want to and serve with some nice, you know, if you want to double your starch, most people have bread, serve with a nice salad, maybe throw some nuts in there for a little bit of protein because you should, but this pasta itself obviously is high pro pasta, so it's like eating a piece of chicken, but you could throw some chicken in here, you could throw some shrimp in here if you want, you can throw some mushrooms in here, you, you can do what, whatever you want, you can add to this with everything and anything, uh, whether it's, a, you know, you, you add, you know, chicken, or, you know, you, this is, you can use the same recipe to make just, you know, our American meaty spaghetti or if shrimp. you want, or pre-made meatballs, you know, things like that, which I've done. I make meatballs ahead and I make a big batch. I cook them all and then I lay them on a tray, put them in the freezer, the ones I want to save, let them chill down, put them in baggies and they're all done. So there's no secret to food prep and the whole meal planning is really about your plan, about being organized thinking ahead of what you want to do this week and then looking at what things you know you can really prep just about anything you can prep your beans you can prep your your grains you can prep your your vegetables not too much unless you're gonna you know you can't do too much salad ahead things like that you can do it for a day or two uh but still pretty much better fresh torn or if you're just buying ready to go salad right out of the bag right don't wash it just put it in the bowl um and but having that plan and having things together will help you with that meal prep and just do it clean and do it safe is the biggest thing that you have to remember. Okay. Anything you want to say, Mindy, you want to come back in to um, just right here. Come right here. You're you walk in the kitchen. I'm walking okay. in the kitchen. Hello. I'm here. So. Okay. Here okay. I am. Yes. Yeah, she's there. So and I'm here. So you can take, what we were talking about, you could have one or two meatless meals a week. 
as you said, you could throw broccoli in this. You could put zucchini, yellow squash. And right. instead of having a, the round plate, you just have a one meal supper, right. one bowl supper. Okay. I want to, we've only got a few minutes left. So Josh, uh, I want to say hello to the people that are here. And if there's any questions that they have, uh, we need to do that, I guess, because we have another program coming on right afterwards. Uh, let's start with saying hi to Tom and Karen and Molly and John and Melissa. Awesome. Hello. Thank yeah, you, guys. just been enjoying everything. Tom said, uh, thank you. Great presentation. He's going to get his dinner just a bit ago. Same with <laughs> us. This is our dinner. I planned this this way. This is what we eat tonight. Okay. And then no, no questions. It was so clear and everything that. Okay. That's great. Yeah, so Josh has promised. <laughs> a bunch of highs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as promised, we finished before seven. You so, did good work today. Absolutely. We, we try to do good work. Believe me. So, all right, folks, this is chef Rob and dietitian, mm -hmm. the, the aortic dietitian, the aortic chef signing off for today join us in two weeks from today uh for the next aortic kitchen where i will be doing appetizers and that'll be a full food demo uh program on uh, two wednesdays from today and it'll be appetizers and join us tomorrow at hangouts uh two o'clock you you get that uh make sure you get your invitations that you're signed up for all the meetings and so on and when you're done watching this, please do hit that like button. Whether you like it or not, hit the like button. Okay? Thanks and, a lot. Uh, also, we're going to be dropping that Aegean video next Wednesday for everyone. Oh. oh. All right. We finally got a video that we took in Greece, cooking on the, sh the boat in the middle of the Aegean the Sea. The yacht. In, in the yacht. Yes, it was a sailing yacht. It was. That held, you know, there were uh, 14 people on that boat, the catamaran. So anyways. That'll, you look for that. And we're ready to do it again. On the Hold aortic. On. John uh, says, kitchen. what's your question? John, John says, I have a question. What's your question, Brenny? He's not, he's not going to say anything now. He's just toying with us. He's trolling us. <gasps> okay. But he can ask tomorrow in Hangouts, because I know John will be there. Is it safe to leave hot food out? Wait, wait. Well, no. depends for how is long. Safe to, hmm. Is it safe to leave hot food out too and let it come to room temperature? Depends how hot it is and how long that takes. Okay. So, uh, uh, like I said, you want to get it down to 70 degrees within two hours is the rule. So, if you can do that, you can leave it out. If you, but you got to stir it once in a while, depending on what it is. Is it really thick? Is it thin? Is it, you know, is this a piece of meat? So as a general rule, just try to get it as cold as you can, as quick Quickly as you as can. can. So let's just say I got the sauce in the sink, in the cold water, that'll cool down real fast. Uh, spread things out. If I had, you know, if I didn't have the water, take the pasta and put on a sheet pan and just spread it out and let it cool. Or just put things in the fridge without a lid. Okay, that is accepted by the health department. You put a partially covered, you take a, put something in the refrigerator and just put the lid on sideways. Uh, so you don't forget to close it up once it's cool, but allow the steam to get out. And, you know, and we're just trying to that, prevent spoilage, spoilage and provide prevent stomach aches. Okay. So, what, like, say you cooked a roast, whether it's a pork loin or anything else, you do not have to cover that for the first hour, because if you do cover it, it will stay hotter longer and allow the potential of bacteria to grow. All right. So. I hope that answers your question, John. You can, as long as you watch it and take care to make sure it uh, cools down. Better, you know, it's not going to cool down any quicker necessarily uh, when it's really that hot to just throw it in the fridge. So you can give it a little bit on room temp. Okay. All right. That's great. Thank you. Yep. And we will see you guys tomorrow. We're going to have a special guest tomorrow on Hangouts, just to let you know. We hopefully, know. <laughs> if she shows up. We're going to have Deanne Maples from the Florida Beef Council and the Cattlemen's Association join us to answer some questions about beef. And uh, Christina already knows that she's coming. But she's got her list to challenge her ready. Correct. <laughs> That's cool. That's very cool. Yep. Okay.
Thank you all for coming. Have a great night, and we'll see you on the next one.